mothers uh, since we are from different time zones and uh, we are glad to find such a huge gathering of audience learner delegates from the academia dignitaries distinguished guests from across the different states of the country and abroad Mm -hmm. I am Chainika Senapati, and I feel privileged to welcome you all on behalf of Krishna Kanto Hondikoi State Open University to the Krishna Kanto Hondikoi Memorial Lecture 2020. Today is 28 July, the birth anniversary of Professor Krishna Kanto Hondikoi, and our university celebrates this day with Krishna Kanto Hondikoi Memorial Lecture. This year, due to COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we are celebrating this special occasion in a digital platform. It is indeed a matter of great pride and privilege to have here with us Professor Sergei Dmitrievich Serebriani from Russian State University, who will delivering the memorial lecture, and Professor Ranjit Kumar Devagoswami, former Srimanto Hongkodev Chair, Tejpur University, who will chair the function. So without, uh, without wasting much time uh, with these words, I thank you all once again for joining us today in this auspicious occasion. And uh, before moving further, I would like to request all to keep your microphones muted throughout the program for better and glitch-free uh, hearing experience. We'll start our program just after the rendition of the university anthem. So for this, I request our system analyst, Mr. Binod Deka, to play the university anthem. Binod, please. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Vinod Deka. May I now request our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Kondo Podasa, to kindly deliver the welcome address. Sir, please, over to you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, as we belong to different time zones. Respected Sergei Dimitrievich Siribiani, the speaker of today's memorial lecture. Respected Professor Rajit Kumar Bogusami, the chair for today's function. Respected Professor Sinat Barua, the founder, vice chancellor of KK Hendrick State Open University. Former vice chancellor, KK Hendrick State Open University, Dr. Hitesh Deka. Respected vice chancellors of various universities of Assam and country and abroad. Respected Madam Srimuti Ohila Gugoi, the former member of the Board of Management, KK Hendrick State Open University, and daughter of Krishokanta Hondikoi. Distinguished guests, esteemed colleagues, the audience from different parts of the globe, ladies and gentlemen. It is my privilege and honor to welcome you all to the Krishnakanta Hondikoi Memorial Lecture, organized to celebrate the birth anniversary of the legendary Indologist and the scholar extraordinary, Krishnakanta Hondikoi, in whose name this university has been christened. Krishnakanda Hondikoi was a celebrated personality who made the inculcation of knowledge the motto of his life. A voracious leader who made research the lifeline of a public intellectual. And many reasons to remember him today with a great respect and reverence. Hondikoi's acumen as a great Sanskrit scholar has been accepted unanimously by the academic communities of the world. Noishadarit of Sri Harsha, 1934, Jasastilika and Indian Culture, 1949, and Pravarsana Setuvan, 1976, where the three monumental works of rare scholars were his document as a researcher best reflected. A man who had profundity of as many as 11 languages, including Greek, Spanish, French, German, Russian, and other European languages. A scholar who enthusiastically consumed the literature, culture, and philosophies of different languages in countries of the world, including those of India. As Ampedity said, the pursuit of knowledge is education. It is an image of life here. This is the greatness of a man whom we all call the score extraordinary AK Hondiko. Krishnakanda Hondiko State Open University is the 14th open university of India and only state open university in the entire Northeast. In a short span of 40 years, the university has been able to scale new heights in, the, in providing access to higher education to a large number of diversified and diversified section of the society. With a large learner base, Krishnakanda Hendiko State in Open University utilizes the information and communication technology based online services supplemented by a face-to-face -face counseling the study centers spread across the state of Assam. The aim of the university is to develop and provide accessible both of quality higher education and training with the use of latest educational technologies. Committed to provide quality higher education through open and distance learning. The contribution of KK Hendricks community was recognized by the result of learning award of excellence for institutional achievement in distance education in 2013. And because of the inherent flexibility in terms of place and place of learning, the Krishnakanda State Open University holds the promise of providing equality of opportunities for higher education and bringing into its fold the deprived and marginalized sections of the society. The present COVID-19 pandemic has thrown the academic community in an unusual situation. And all of us shift our focus 
to innovate new technology in teaching learning in order to keep the door of learning open for the large number of students who have been deprived of the basic access to learning. Both conventional face-to-face -face as well as the open and distance learning institutions have been trying to cope up with the new normal by adapting themselves into the online mode of teaching learning. The Krishnakanda Handicoy State Open University has also been working towards reorienting its teaching learning ecosystem with a more student-centric teaching learning approach. It had been, uh, it had made use of web-based support services so that learners do not feel isolated and discouraged while pursuing different academic programs. Live online classes, audiovisual presentations, and links of a pre-recorded programs are some of the different online support that are provided that are provided for the benefit of the learners. Apart from that, measures have been also been taken so that learners can effectively utilize the different digital educational resources that are widely available in the public domain. The Krishnakanta Handikoy State Open University is poised to take the distance education system to another level with the launching of the university's learning management system within the next few days. We can take the pride in the fact that the K. Hendrick State Open has initiated a pioneering step in the direction by organizing a two day online international conference on teaching learning, the time pandemic role of online in April this year, which drew participants from various parts of the country as well as from other Asian countries like Indonesia. Malaysia, Vietnam, Hong Kong, Japan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and also few participants from Europe and the United States of America, and also Canada. Presently, the university has a pool of dynamic young academicians and non teaching staff who have been working relentlessly so as to uphold the university's motto of education beyond barriers. We are hopeful that in the coming years, KK Hendrick State Open University will continue to better to the needs of testing learners and become the torchbearer of the open and distance learning in this part of the country. We know that there are many challenges to meet, but with great dedication and determination, we are overcoming all these challenges and emerge as one of the best universities of the country in the days to come. Kandikoy State Open University has been celebrating the 28th July of each year by organizing a memorial lecture delivered by renowned personality of our society. I'm glad to mention here that the very first lecture of this series on this day was delivered in 2007 by none other than Professor Ranjit Kumar Devagoswami, who is the chair of today's function. It is a great matter of for the university that Nobel laureate Sri Kailas Siddharthi, eminent poet and filmmaker Sri Buddhadev Dasgupta, facilitator Dr. Nagin Saikya, honorable speaker of the Assam Legislative Assembly, Mr. Kitendranath Goswami, and former vice senior of Assam Agriculture University, Professor Kamal Mallubhidurvura, were among the distinguished personalities who had delivered the memorial lectures in the past. Due to COVID 19 pandemic and the subsequent lockdown in different parts of the state, this year, the lecture will be delivered online by eminent Indologist, Professor Sergei Dimitrievich Serebriani from the Russian State University for Humanities, Moscow, Russia. On behalf of the Krishnakanda Hondi State University, I take this opportunity to extend a hearty welcome to Professor Serebriani. We're also happy to once again have amongst us Professor Ranjit Kumar Devagoswami former head department of English Kohate University and former Srimanth Sankardev chair Ispur University, who has kindly agreed to chair this occasion. I welcome you, sir. Finally, I thank you all for joining us on this important day of the university. And once again, welcome you all to the memorial lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you so much, sir, for your very enlightening welcome address. Now we are going to launch the university newsletter, Horizon, volume 15, number 2, 2020. And for this, I would like to request uh, the founder, Vice Chancellor, Krishna Kanto Hondigoy, State Open University, Professor Srinath Burwasa, to do the honors and declare the Horizon launch. Sir, please unmute your mic. Sir, please unmute your mic. Sir, you're muted. Please unmute your mic, sir. Okay, now it's okay. Now it's okay. Yes, now okay. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, Professor Gusmami, the president of this uh, lecture meeting. Then uh, Professor Sergi. Then the Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Das and the distinguished guest. I'm extremely happy that I have been invited to attend this particular lecture and also release the newsletter of the University Horizon. I therefore formally release the Horizon, that is the volume number 15, number two, and thank you all. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. We are glad that you are in this forum. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Dear guest uh, and the dignitary is here. You will find the link for the same in the chat box. We have also amongst with us, uh, Srimati Ahalya Gogoi, daughter of Krishna Kanta Hondikoi. And I request her to say a few words as a tribute to her father and the legendary scholar, Professor Krishnakanta Hondigoy. Ma'am, please unmute your mic and over to you. Binod, can we spotlight her? Binod? Am I audible? Yes, 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 audible. Yes, 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 okay. Go down. Vinod. Yes. Hello, Bara. Binod, uh, she is not able to unmute herself. Can we uh, help her in this regard? Yes, I think she can. She can. Okay, okay ma'am, now you can. Do you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes ma'am, now we can hear you. Yes, yes. Do you hear me? Yes. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, ma'am. We can hear you. Hello. Do you hear me? Hello. Yes, ma'am. Yes, 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 yes ma'am. Yes. Respected, respected president. Do you hear me? Respected president. Yes, yes, madam. Yes, we hear you. Yes, ma'am. Honorable, honorable vice chancellor, KK Handy Open University, and honorable guest of respected guest of honor. Professor Brilliant and my, 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 my dear students, ladies and gentlemen, I at the outset I offer my gratitude for speaking a few words at this August gathering on the occasion of the birth and by of my father. I pray to God 
Dr. Peels and Eternity, uh, my beloved Father K.K. Handy. Also, I, my blessing and I spare my wish to the university for the prosperity and grand success in every step of the developments. I also wish to the students of the university, university for their peace and progress. I also offer my blessing to the members of the all the uh, uh, university community. Lastly, I offer again to our guest of honor, Professor Serafrieri, my thankful, respectful namaskar to you, my moi apuna mantoror bhaktipurno namaskar zonaisu. Ami apna ke onto onto theke bhaktipurno namaskar zonaisi. Ab ab hokalu ke namaskar zonaisu. Thank you, ma'am. We are happy that you are in this forum and thank you so much for your work. Funisa. Funisa, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. So I take the privilege to introduce today's speaker for the memorial lecture, Professor Saragi Dimitrievich Serebriani. Professor Serebriani is currently the director, E.M. Melitinsky Institute of Advanced Studies in the Humanities, Russian State University for the Humanities, Moscow and an alumnus of Institute of Oriental Languages, Moscow State University, where he learned Hindi, Sanskrit, Bengali, and Urdu languages and literatures. He also studied at Varanasya Sanskrit University, Varanasi, Banaras Hind University, and Deccan College, Pune. A PhD on the works of 15th century Indian author Vidyapati, Professor Sarebriani has done important researches in the Gorky Institute of World Literature, Moscow, and uh, Ramakrishna Mission Institute of Culture, Kolkata. He has also been a visiting professor of comparative literature in Urbana campaign, uh, Illinois, uh, USA. And Professor Sarebriani takes a special interest in the history of Indian literature and culture, history of philosophy, comparative uh, cultural and literary studies, and Russian Indology in the global context. He has to his credit a large number of books and research papers on the different aspects of history, culture, and Sanskrit studies. To name a few, Vidyapati, a monograph on a 15th century Indian author, The Lotus Sutra, a preface of the first Russian translation, the novel in modern Indian culture, Russia and India, literature, thought, history are some of his most distinguished works. Professor Sarebriani has also translated several works from Bengali, Hindi and Sanskrit to Russian, besides writing a long commentary on Virendra Kumar Bharacharya's magnum opus, Mrittunjoy, in its the Russian language. I welcome you, sir. I would also like to take the honor to introduce today's chair for the event, Professor Ranjit Kumar Devagoswami. Professor Ranjit Kumar Devagoswami was former Sri Manto Hongkodev Chair at uh, Tejpur University. Earlier, he was Professor, Department of English, Gauhati University. And erudite scholar, Professor Devagoswami explores different dimensions of Assamese literary and cultural life. He has made substantial contribution to the growth and expansion of Assamese critical thought from early 70s to, uh, of the last century till date. As a polymath, his areas of concern include literary criticism and cultural anthropology. His uh, scholarship on the great medieval saint Srimanto Hongkordev is influential in the field of Assamese Vaishnavite studies. He has edited two significant volumes, one on Dr. Bani Kanto Kakoti and the other on Shankardeva. His lectures and papers on the contribution of the great Indologist and Sanskrit scholar uh, Krishna Kanta Hondikoy also bear testimony to his scholarly research. He is the author of Prabandha, uh, published in 2015, a second and large edition of the same published in 2019. I welcome you, sir. So may I now request Professor Ranjit Kumar Devagoswami, sir, to chair the function and give his opening remarks. So please unmute yourself and over to you, sir. So please unmute yourself. As uh, 
a polymer scholar, pioneer of uh, comparative. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, we can hear you, sir. Yeah, this is a day of remembrance, and we remember K. K. Hendrick as a polymer scholar, pioneer of comparative poetics in India, founder principal Jorhat College, which eventually became J. B. College. Jorhat, founder vice chancellor Guwahati University, an astute administrator, noted philanthropist, and above all, a man of virtue and character, a great soul. As has been pointed out by the Vice Chancellor, Professor Das, he was the author of Naisada Charita of Sri Harsha, Yasas Tilaka in Indian Culture, and Prabhasana Setu Bandha. And he has also left behind him a body of Assamese writings marked by uh, insights into aspects of world literature, including the importance of interlanguage translation. Translation as discovery, translation as an agency of renewal and change in the life of a people. I now have the privilege of inviting Professor Serebliani to give the memorial lecture 2020. But before that, let me let me uh, uh, speak to Professor Srinath Bora. He has done a commendable job of publishing Ahalya Gogoi's book on K.K. Hendrik. It was translated into English by my former colleague, Sandeep Kumar Nath. That was published in 2014 when uh, Professor Srinath Bhuva was the Vice Chancellor of the University. Thank you. And now I invite Professor Serebriani to give the memorial speech. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, so shall I, shall I begin? Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, okay, so uh, this thing, uh, respected uh, Srimati Ahola Gogoi, uh, respected chairman, R Professor Ranjit Kumar Dev Goswami, uh, Vice Chancellor, uh, and Professor Kandar Padas, dear guests and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is for the first time in my life that I'm going it, giving it talk across such a distance and across so many borders, natural and national, that is political. I hope you hear me well, well enough, and will keep hearing me well enough. The invitation to deliver the Krishna Konta Hondikoi Memorial Lecture has been both a great honor and, of course, a challenge, as well as a great pleasure for me. It is with great pleasure that I recall my visit to Assam in October 2012, almost eight years ago. I had been invited to a conference in Shipsagar, but first I came to Guwahati and stayed for some days there. Then we drove with Professor Kandar Padas and two more Indian scholars all the way along the Brahmaputra Valley up to Shipsagar. I was fascinated with the landscapes of rural Assam and the towns that we passed, Tezpur in the first place. By the end of our trip, we passed Jorhat, the native town of Krishna Konta Hondikoi. After the conference in Ship Sagar, we drove to Dibrugar to take a flight back to Delhi. So in 2012, I had very memorable personal impressions of Assam. It was then in Guwahati that Professor Kandar Padas introduced me to the personality of Krishna Kanta Handekoy. Before that, I had met the name in books and remember wondering why an Indian should have such a strangely uh, sounding name. Professor Kandar Padas explained to me that the name was of a home origin and took me to the library of Gohati University, to a spacious hall where the books of Krishna Kanta Hondekoi were kept. We came up to a big bookcase full of books in Russian. There was not enough time to get well acquainted with the books, but I noticed that at least some of them had been published in Berlin by Russian emigre publishers. 
I asked Professor Kandar Padas if there was a list of the books in that bookcase. The answer was no. I realized then that Krishna Kanta Hondikoy was an outstanding personality and that Russian Indologists should take special interest in him and his legacy. But in the following years, because of other concerns, I could not attend to this task. The invitation to deliver this lecture has given me an opportunity to learn more about Krishna Kanta Hondikoy, about his life and his work. Among other things, I have been able to read some chapters of his biography written by his daughter, Srimati Ahola Gogoy, and the very informative foreword to the book by the chair, Professor Ranjit Kumar Dev Goswami. I read, of course, the English translation. I have learned that there are at least two other books, but they were not available to me. In fact, the book of Srimati Gogoy has whetted my appetite to know more about Krishna uh, Hondakoy, and I hope to learn more in the future. Uh, but from uh, what I have managed to read, I have got an impression that a full-fledged intellectual biography of Krishna Kanta Hondakoy, a biography which would also describe the historical and cultural background of this extraordinary personality. Such a biography is still to be written and published. The first chapter of Srimati Gogoi's book is titled The Story of Origins. Among other things, we find there a striking story about the origin of the very surname Hondikoi. According to a legend, once upon a time, a Nahom king marching through a thick forest was stopped by a fast flowing river. So one of the king's companions felled a huge tree to bridge the river. Since then, the king called this person Han Di Kai, which in their home language meant bridge maker, he who builds bridges. That inventive person is said to be an ancestor of Krishna Kanta Hondikoy. This story, I would say, sounds symbolic. Krishna Kanta Hondikoy, too, may be justly called a bridge maker, a builder of bridges in several senses. First, we may say that he continued his family tradition of building bridges between the various historical periods in the history of Assam. His ancestors were high ranking people, we may say aristocrats, in their home kingdom. Later, they must have well adjusted themselves to the British rule, so that Krishna Kanta's father, Radha Kanta Handikoy, was a rich tea planter and got the title Rai Bahadur. Krishna Kanta Hondikoy has taken full advantage of this social and financial status in British India to get the high quality education along European lines. As Professor Dev Goswami has put it, Krishna Kanta has been a product of the golden age of Calcutta University. Later in the 1920s, he continued his education in Oxford, Paris, and Berlin, in independent India, he went on with his scholarly research work and also became the first vice chancellor of Gauhati University, the first university in Northeast India. In the world of scholarly work as such, Krishna Kanda Handikoy may be called a builder of bridges between the traditional Sanskrit learning in Assam and India in general, on the one hand, and modern European scholarship on the other. <clears throat> At this point, I may express my hope that in the not too distant future, Krishna Kanta Hondikoy will prove to be a builder of bridges between India in general and Assam in particular on the one hand, and Russia, Russian culture on the other. American colleagues, have told me that in any lecture, even a very serious one, there must be some moments of fun. Otherwise, listeners will get tired and will not listen to you. 
So I venture to offer you an elfish suggestion. Krishnakanta Hondikoy, by the end of his life, chose to study and translate the poem under the title Setu Bandha, Building a Bridge. Because, among other reasons, he probably felt some affinity between the title and the subject matter of the poem and his surname. Actually, Hondikoy may be translated into Sanskrit as Setu Bandhin, or perhaps Setu Bandhaka. From the book of Srimati Gogoi, I have learned that Handikoy bought some 2,000 books on European literature while in Berlin. Later, he managed to bring those books to his home in Assam. Reading this, I immediately recalled the bookcase with Russian books at Gohat University Library. Berlin in the 1920s was an important center of Russian emigration and of Russian emigre book publishing. A question may and should be posed, why and how Handikoy came to be interested in Russia, in the Russian language and in Russian books. He could hardly study Russian in India before going to Europe in 1920. As far as I know, there was no such thing as Russian studies in India in those years. It looks like he developed interest in things Russian while living in Berlin in 1925, 1926. We get some interesting hints in this respect from Srimati Gogoi's book. Describing Hendiko's life in Berlin, Srimati Gogoi mentions several expatriate Indians whom her father met there. Thus, and I quote, he made friends with an old Indian professor, Muhammad Barkatullah, who was the son, the son of a royal employee of the king of Bhopal in India. Krishna Kanta was very close to Barkatullah, and they had walks together in the evening, unquote. This Muhammad Barkatullah must have been indeed an interesting person to mix with and to talk to. He was born in 1854 in Bhopal and died in 1927 in San Francisco. Wikipedia defines him as an Indian revolutionary with sympathy for the pan-Islamic movement. In 1915, during First World War, Barkatullah became the prime minister of the so-called provisional government of India at Kabul in Afghanistan. In the spring of 1919, with a delegation of this provisional government, Barkatullah came to Moscow and had a talk with Lenin and probably with Trotsky, the two leaders of the Bolsheviks. Barkatullah tried to invite them to export their revolution to India via Afghanistan. Uh, but fortunately, both for India and for Russia, this revolutionary project never came true. Barkatullah lived in the former Russian Empire till 1922, traveling to the regions inhabited by Muslims. I wonder if we can learn more what he told Handikai about Russia during their walks together in Berlin in 1925-26. Incidentally, Bhopal University, established in 1970, was rechristened in 1988 as Barkatullah University, or in Hindi, Barkatullah Vishwavidyali. Another expatriate Indian whom Handikai met in Berlin was Birindranath Chattopadhyay, a brother of Sarojini Naidu, the poet. In 1914, he went to Berlin and in 1920 to Moscow. In 1921, he had a talk with Lenin and went back to Berlin. Later, he again came to Moscow and was executed there in 1937, together with some other Indian communists who also mishappened to be there at that time. Again, it would be interesting to learn more, if it is possible, about the context between the Bengali communists and their Assamese scholar. Early in Paris, Handikoy had met another Bengali, 
another Indian Muslim by name Hassan Shahid Suhravardi, who belonged to a well-known Bengali family. His uncle, Sir Abdullah Al-Mamun Suhravardi, an Islamic scholar and educationist, corresponded with Left Tolstoy in 1907-09. His younger brother, Hussein Shahid Suhravardi, a politician, was for about a year in the late 1950s, the fifth prime minister of Pakistan. As to Hassan Shahid Suhravardi himself, he studied at the University of Calcutta and Oxford University, and then in 1914, went to Moscow to study the Russian language. He left Russia after the events of 1917, but came back in 1926 to work for some years with the Moscow Art Theater. He is said to have spoken Russian fluently. Again, it would be interesting to know more about the context between this extraordinary person and Krishna Kanta uh, Handikoy. In any case, these three expatriate Indians, Muhammad Barkatullah, Birendranath Chattopadhyay, and Hassan Shahid Suhravardi in Berlin and in Paris, could tell Handikoy a lot about Russia and awaken his interest in Russian culture and the Russian language. In the 1920s, Berlin was an important center of Russian emigration, as I have already said. I do not know to what extent people in India are aware of the scale, scale and nature of that emigration. We call it now the emigration of the first wave to distinguish it from the emigration of the second wave, which took place during and immediately after Second World War, and the emigration of the third wave, which happened in the 1970s and 1980s. After the revolution of 1917 and the succeeding civil war, uh, for various reasons, many people left the former Russian empire. Till now, exact figures are not known, but the figure about 2 million seem, seems to be a fair estimation. And many of those people were well-educated, engineers, scientists, scholars, writers, poets, lawyers, painters, actors, composers, singers, and last not least, military officers. In the 1920s, Berlin was full of such Russians. They established their own publishing houses and opened bookshops. Hendikoy might have bought his Russian books in such Russian bookshops, where he must have met Russians and must have heard the Russian language spoken around. In 1926, in Paris, he attended the performance of Anton Chekhov's Cherry Orchard, staged by Russian actors in the Russian language. We may presume that he understood the Russian language spoken on the stage there. Is it not probable that during his two years stay in Berlin, Krishna Kanta could get some Russian acquaintances? Let me once again offer to you a risky hypothesis. Vladimir Nabokov, a young Russian emigre, who later in the 1950s became famous as an American writer, the, the author of Lalita and other novels, from 1922 up to 1937 lived in Berlin. Born in St. Petersburg in April of 1899, Vladimir Nabokov was only nine months younger than Krishna Kanta Handikoy. In 1925-26 in Berlin, they were both in their mid-twenties. They could easily meet each other there in Berlin in those years. Moreover, it was then and there that Nabokov wrote his first novel in Russian under the title Mashinka, in English translation Mary. The novel was published in 1926 in Berlin. It told the story about Russian emigres there in Berlin. Krishna Kanta might have bought the book or even might have got it as a present from the author. It may well be kept in that bookcase in Guwahati University Library. Be it as it may, 
the description and study of the Russian books in that bookcase may be the first joint undertaking of scholars from Russia, Moscow, and Assam, probably Guwahati. In Russia, we have got quite a tradition of describing the books, the libraries, left after the passing away of eminent person. In this context, I may mention the detailed description in several volumes of the books kept in Yasne Poliana, Lev Tolstoy, hereditary state near the town of Tula to the south of Moscow. Incidentally, there are some books there which Tolstoy got from his Indian correspondents. For instance, there is the book, The Sayings of Muhammad, compiled by Abdullah al Mamun Zuhravardi and published in London in 1905, a book about Gandhi by Joseph John Doak, published in London in 1908, and others. Many books in Yasne Poliana have got dedicatory inscriptions of the authors to Lev Tolstoy. In many books, there are various notes in the margins but by Lev Tolstoy and the members of his family. Similar inscriptions and notes may be found in Handikoy's Russian books, so we may learn whom he met in Berlin and perhaps elsewhere in Europe, and what he thought about the books he bought and read. In Moscow, there is so-called Alexander Solzhenitsyn House of Russian Diaspora, founded by Alexander Solzhenitsyn himself in 1995, after he came back to Russia after the 20 years of <clears throat> forced exile. This house is both a museum, a library, a research center, and a publishing house, whose objective is to study all the waves of Russian immigration, their lives and their achievements, their contribution to Russian culture and to what may be called world culture. Distinguished scholars work at the research center there, and I'm happy to be acquainted with some of them. So we may invite them to take part in studying Handikai's Russian books. It would mean that those books get the best possible expertise. Some of those books may prove to be quite rare and precious, not easily available in today's Russia. Looking forward, to this SME's Russian cooperation in research work, I may also suggest that to begin with, we may translate and get published in Moscow the essay of Handikoy about Chekhov's cherry orchard that he saw staged in Paris in 1926 by Russian actors. At our university, there is a department of theater and cinema studies. I have consulted colleagues from this department and have been told that scholars in Russia would be very much would very much appreciate the publication of such an essay in Russian. That way, we would add some one some we would add one more story to the general history of Indo-Russian cultural relations. Actually, this general history has not yet been adequately investigated and described, but there are some episodes that are often and I dare say ritually, evoked when the relations between India and Russia are spoken about on official occasions. One of such episodes is the visit to India in the 15th century of a Russian merchant from the city of Tver by name Afanasi Nikitin. That visit is usually evoked to emphasize the allegedly ages-long tradition of Indo-Russian contact. But if we look into the matter more closely, we see that the voyage of Afanasi Nikitin to India and back home looks rather like a symbol of the failure to establish any meaningful context between Russia and India in the 15th century and in several succeeding centuries. All that we know about Afanasi Nikitin is the meager information that he gives about himself in his notes a kind of diary which he brought from India. 19th century editors supplied the title to those notes, A Voyage Across Three Seas. Afanasi Nikitin was no doubt an extraordinary person, 
brave and enterprising and quite educated. His notes are unique among many other pre-modern Russian writings. For many centuries, he remained the only Russian to visit India and to leave notes about the visit. The notes are unique in their multilinguality. The bulk of the text is in a rather archaic Russian and or Church Slavonic, but there are sizable fragments in Turkic, Farsi, and even Arabic. This multilinguality creates problems for modern translators. From his notes, we learn that Afanasi Nikitin in the 1470s, rather by chance, got to India via Iran and stayed for about three years in the Bahmani Sultanate. He was a merchant and hoped to find in India some merchandise to be sold at home. In this, he was completely disappointed. He found nothing that he could take and sell in Russia. Some modern commenter, commentators suggest that he might have taken from India some precious stones. But on his way home in the Ottoman Empire, Afanasi was utterly robed and sailed over the Black Sea only with his notes. He did not reach even his native principality of Tver and died near the city of Smolensk which then belonged to the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. His notes were passed to Moscow and included in local annual chronicles, but evidently did not attract much attention for several centuries. They were discovered at the beginning of the 19th century by the famous historian and writer Nikolai Karamzin, but again did not attract much public attention all through the 19th in the first half of the 20th century. It is only since the late 1940s, with the development of relations between the USSR and independent India, that Afanasi Nikitin gradually became a famous and symbolic figure. In 1955, in the city of Tver, a monument to Afanasi Nikitin was erected with the financial help from India. But Afanasi's notes, this voyage over three seas, have been not so far for various reasons, properly studied and even adequately translated into modern Russian. There is no adequate translation into English either. Another episode of cultural relations between Russia and India, which is often and ritually evoked, is of course the correspondence between Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi and Lev Tolstoy. The traveling of Afanasi Nikitin is used as a symbol of the alleged historical depth of Indo-Russian relations. The correspondence between Gandhiji and Tolstoy is often presented as a symbol of the alleged spiritual depth of those relations. But again, if we look into the matter more closely, we will see that the story about Gandhi G. and Tolstoy reveals something almost opposite. The considerable differences between the cultural worlds to which Gandhi G. and Tolstoy belonged, the low level of mutual understanding between the two great persons, and I dare say the absence of lasting historical consequences of this correspondence, at least for Russia. In other words, the significance of that correspondence as such should not be overestimated. During the last decades of his life, Tolstoy, having become world famous, received a lot of letters from a lot of countries. The largest number of letters came from the USA. In 2004, in Moscow, a book of almost 1,000 pages titled Tolstoy, and the USA correspondence was published. Here is this. In this book, almost 70 American correspondents of Tolstoy are represented. All in all, we are told Tolstoy got from the USA more than 1,800 letters and sent back about 300 letters. Between 1896 and 1910, Tolstoy corresponded also with more than 20 Indians, 
some of them well known, like Sir Abdullah Al Mamun Sukharwardi or Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, some quite obscure ones. In terms of time, Gandhi was the last in the list. A colleague of mine in Moscow, Dr. Tatiana Zagorodnikova, published in 2013 a book of almost 300 pages titled Tolstoy and India Correspondence. The book contains more than 100 letters from India or Indians to Tolstoy and Tolstoy's replies, including the correspondence with Gandhiji. Those more than 100 letters deserve a special detailed study, which has not yet been undertaken. The usual pattern of Tolstoy's correspondence with Indians was like this. An Indian would write a letter to Tolstoy asking some questions or making some requests. Tolstoy would send a reply. The Indian would write again. But after two or three letters from the correspondent, Tolstoy would lose interest and stop the correspondence. Gandhi's case was exceptional. The correspondence stopped because Tolstoy died. Gandhiji wrote his first letter to Tolstoy from London on the 1st of October 1909, about a year before Tolstoy's death. In this letter, Gandhiji wrote about his campaign of passive resistance in South Africa and requested Tolstoy to confirm his authorship of a letter to a Hindu that had appeared in 1908. Gandhiji wanted to reprint that letter and to translate it into Gujarati. Among other things, Gandhiji asked Tolstoy for permission to delete from the letter the criticism of the idea of transmigration, which, in Gand as Gandhi added, was a cherished belief with millions of India. Tolstoy replied quite quickly with a short letter. He confirmed his authorship of a letter to a Hindu, welcomed its translation in Gujarati, and remarked, I quote, I would not like to exclude the word reincarnation because in my opinion, the belief in reincarnation can never be as firm as the belief in the immortality of soul and in the justice and love of God, but do as you like. On the 10th of November, still from London, Gandhi sent another letter to Tolstoy together with the book about himself by Joseph John Doak, the book, as I have already said, is still there in the library of Jasne Palyana. But this letter remained unanswered. Tolstoy fell ill, Gandhi's letter was misplaced and was found only in 1956. Later, Gandhi sent to Tolstoy a copy of his English translation of the English translation of his book, Hind Swaraj. But we do not know to what extent Tolstoy was able to read it. Unfortunately, the book itself has not been preserved in Jasne Palyana. All in all, we have four letters from Gandhiji to Tolstoy and three letters from Tolstoy to Gandhiji. Tolstoy's last letter, written on the 7th of September 1910, two and a half months before his death, is the longest. In that letter, Tolstoy expounded his ideas about nonviolence and non-resistance to evil. The letter reads, sorry, the letter reads as a kind of summary of some chapters of his book, The Kingdom of God is Within You. No doubt, the seven letters that Tolstoy and Gandhiji wrote to each other are precious human documents, but they not, do not add much to our knowledge about these great persons. Nevertheless, the whole story of the relations between the Russian writer and the Indian politician has be been and remains a very important historical phenomenon which has not yet been studied and appreciated properly. For Tolstoy, the acquaintance with Gandhiji during the last year of his Tolstoy's life was hardly of much importance. Though he might have been pleased to learn about one more partisan of nonviolence in the faraway South Africa. For Gandhiji, his personal contact with Tolstoy in the very middle of his Gandhi's life was much 
was most probably more important, but this context could could hardly add much to Gandhi's ideas about nonviolence and related subjects. Gandhi had already experienced a strong influence of Tolstoy's ideas much earlier through Tolstoy's writing. It is for us now in Russia, and I suppose in India as well, that intellectual relations between Gandhiji and Tolstoy have acquired a significance, which I would not dare call great, but which is, I'm sure, quite considerable. Studying those relations and thinking about them may help us better know and understand our present situation, our present predicaments. I'm not competent enough to talk about India in this respect, but I will try and tell you how things look from the Russian side. Mm. Sorry. Uh, yes, I may refer to my own personal experience. I will tell you how Gandhiji has helped me better understand and appreciate Tolstoy. But first, I must tell you, I must tell you how my generation of Soviet people had perceived Tolstoy and his writings. Fortunately, Tolstoy did not live long enough to see the Bolshevik take over in 1917-1918. Had he lived to see it, he would have criticized the new order as severely as he had criticized the old one. He would have been labeled a reactionary and would not have been admitted to the Soviet canon of Russian literature. Something like this happened to another a uh, famous 19th century Russian writer, Fyodor Dostoevsky. In the 1920s and in the early 1930s, Dostoevsky was more or less tolerated. But in the mid 1930s, he was condemned as reactionary and practically excluded from the accepted literary canon. Among other things, it was recalled that Lenin had strongly disliked him. Dostoevsky's works were not republished for more than 20 years, and he was rehabilitated with other victims of Stalin's rule only during the so-called Khrushchev's thaw in the late 1950s. Tolstoy's case was different. He was probably too great to be easily dismissed. So in 1928, on Tolstoy's 100th anniversary, his former associate Vladimir Chertkov and his youngest daughter Alexandra Tolstaya were allowed to start the publication of the so-called Jubilee Collected Works. The project has taken about 30 years to complete. All in all, 90 huge volumes have been published, and the last ones saw the light of the day again only under Khrushchev. Tolstoy was admitted to the Soviet canon of Russian literature, but very selectively. He had lived a long life, more than 80 years. By the age of 50 years, he became famous as the author of big novels, The War and Peace and Anna Karenina in the first place. But about the late 1870s, Tolstoy experienced a kind of intellectual, or you may say spiritual crisis. And after that, though continuing to write pieces of fiction, he wrote quite a number of discursive texts, which may be called religious and or philosophical. It is in this later phase of his life that Tolstoy preached the ideas of non-resistance to evil through violence, or for short, non-violence. He also underwent a very radical religious evolution starting with the criticism of the official Orthodox Christianity and coming by the end of his life to a negation of Christianity at all in favor of rather vague religious doctrines of his own. Tolstoy also became a very radical critic of the Russian imperial state system and in fact of the very institution of the modern state. To use a later term, Tolstoy became a very radical dissident. He could afford being a dissident because he was quite rich and very famous. So, as I have said, 
and like Dostoevsky, Tolstoy was accepted to the Soviet literary canon, but quite selectively. His great novels and other works of fiction were republished and praised, taught at schools. But his religious and philosophical texts and their ideas were practically excluded from the public realm. This selectivity had been prescribed by Lenin, who about 1908 had written several journalistic papers about Tolstoy. The most famous paper was titled Lev Tolstoy as a Mirror of the Russian Revolution. It was under this label that Tolstoy later became acceptable for the Bolshevik establishment. But in fact, Tolstoy was not only a mirror, but also a severe critic in advance, as it were, of the Russian Revolution. But of course, in this capacity, Tolstoy was not acceptable to Bolsheviks. In this paper, Lenin provided a very convenient formula. Tolstoy was a great writer, but a poor thinker. Lenin treated religious and philosophical ideas of Tolstoy, including nonviolence, as petty follies of the great men. Lenin himself, following Karl Marx, considered violence a midwife of history. Lenin believed that a just social order may be, might be established through violence. Now we in Russia have come to know all too well the falsity of this belief. Gandhiji read Tolstoy's works quite selectively too, but his selection was, we may say, the opposite to the Soviet one. As far as I have been able to find out, Gandhiji never read Tolstoy's great novels, The War and Peace, Anna Karenina, The Resurrection. The Tolstoy, which is best known to Russia, hardly existed for Gandhiji at all. But he read and admired several works by Tolstoy, which are practically unknown to most Russians today. In the first place, the book titled The Kingdom of God is Within You. In, this, in his autobiography in the mid-20s, Gandhi wrote, three moderns have left a deep impress on my life and captivated me. Rai Chandbhai by his living contact, Tolstoy by his book, The Kingdom of God is Within You, and John Ruskin by his book, Unto His Last. Well, there are two more quotations about this, but I will skip to save the time. Tolstoy wrote, The Kingdom of God is Within You, at the beginning of the 1890s. As most of his other religious and philosophical writings, it could not be published in Russia and was first published in Russian, but in Germany. In Russia, for many years, it circulated in homemade copies, what later in the Soviet time was called Samizdat, self-publishing. Printed editions appeared in Russia only after the revolution of 1905. After 1917, it was republished for the first time only in 1957 in the 28th volume of the Jubilee Collected Works, which was and is available only in big libraries. Now this edition is available in the internet as well. Last year, while working on a paper for a conference in Jasne Palana, I found in big Moscow bookshops, two recent and rather imperfect editions of this book, published after 2010. I must be ashamed to confess, but I read this book in full only last year. Of course, I had read about it and some parts of it before, but somehow had never felt like reading it as a whole. Probably with my Soviet education, Lenin's opinion that Tolstoy was a poor thinker had been impressed too deep in my mind. Now I agree with some Russian contemporaries of Tolstoy who considered this book just great. I would call it an original treatise on the philosophy of history. Here and now, I cannot possibly analyze this big book as a whole, but let me emphasize that um, this book written more than 100 years ago is very topical now as well. 
Tolstoy passionately expresses his dissatisfaction with the state of the world, of the human society in which he lived. At the beginning of the 1890s, Tolstoy anticipated that, as it were, the horrors of First World War and other wars of the 20th century. Tolstoy wrote with, with awe that contemporary European civilization, including the Russian Empire, was based on violence and that it was imperative to change this violence-based order of life and to go over to a new order of life based on non-violence. He was self-critical enough to confess that he did not know how exactly this radical change could be realized, but he acutely felt that such a change was a must. These ideas must have impressed Gandhiji very much. Nowadays, our world as a whole seems to live through a period of transition. Many people like Tolstoy more than 100 years ago feel that a new order of life is needed, even though, again, like Tolstoy, hardly anybody can offer a universally accepted way to such an order and a universally accepted image of such an order. In Russia, we live through our own period of transition, the transition from our violent Soviet past to an unknown future. And I think that in this period of transition, we should take the ideals of nonviolence preached by Tolstoy and Gandhi much more seriously than we used to do it in the past. Thank you for listening to me. It was wonderful listening to you, sir. Thank you so much for giving your valuable insights and endowing the audience with your words of wisdom, knowledge, and experience on the topic that you selected as a part of the Krishnakanta Hondikoi Memorial Lecture. Thank you so much. May I now request Professor Ranjit Kumar Deva Goswami, sir, to give his concluding remarks. Sir, over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Serebriani, uh, for this very informative and uh, illuminating lecture. Uh, you seem to me to have shed light on uh, several things, including uh, K.K. Handik's uh, life in Berlin uh, during the mid-twenties of the last century. Uh, you also have uh, pointed to a possible link between, this is something very interesting, uh, you have pointed to a possible link between Vladimir Nabokov and K.K. Handik, which you suggest was established in Berlin. You call it a risky hypothesis, but then the risk in this uh, specific context is perhaps uh, worth taking. Uh, thank you so much. And number two, since a large part of the lecture was uh, devoted to a discussion of the concept of nonviolence, uh, uh, with a, a reference to Tolstoy and Gandhi. Uh, may I also offer uh, uh, one suggestion to you? You have already talked about uh, uh, your desire to get uh, uh, Hendrik's essay on uh, Chekhov translated into Russian. May I draw your attention to one of the most important texts uh, uh, that Hendrik uh, had produced. It was in 1949 when he was Vice Chancellor of Guwahati University that he uh, brought out his book, Yasastiloka in Indian Culture, which is a valorization of the concept of ahimsa, non-violence. So it is much in the line of Tolstoy and Gandhi. And it is a journal text. Like, for example, Gandhi was influenced by the Jaina poet uh, who was just two years senior to him, Raj Chandra or Raichan Bhai. So, Gandhi, uh, uh, Hendrik was also a man who was uh, to a great extent influenced by the Jaina concept of Ahimsa. And this is a very interesting text, Yeses Tilaka in Indian culture. Uh, a, a, a great mind walking on a uh, very interesting and abstruse text. Uh, how he has, for example, 
established uh, uh, the, the text in relationship uh, with uh, several other texts of uh, distant antiquity, particularly Greek and Latin classics. This is something uh, 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 really rare in Sanskrit scholarship of the times, which is why, let me uh, say one thing that he was perhaps one of the greatest uh, 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 Sanskrit scholars produced by 20th century India. Anyway, we uh, look forward to listening to Professor Serebriani again uh, in not too distant future. We look forward to listening to him very soon. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Serebriani. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, so please much. remember Yasas Tilaka, Yasas Tilaka in Indian culture. A great book, great book, very great book. Tolstoy, Gandhi, Handy, non violence. Now, what is it that he, 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 he concentrated uh, on this particular text? The earlier text, the early text, for example, was Noise That was published in 1934. Or, for example, Setu Banda. You have uh, 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 talked about Setu Banda. Prabhasana Setu Banda published in 1976. But then, this particular text, 1976, this is well known for its valorization of the concept of Ahimsa. Ahimsa, the official ideology of the freedom struggle of India. Thank you so much, Professor Serebriani. Thank you again. Thank you. I agree that we in Russia, uh, well, I may say that People, even specialists, know rather little about that, this, these great works by Hande, Krishna Kanta Handikoy. Mm -hmm. So we will have to learn more about him, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, yeah. Thank you, sir, for chairing the function. And we are indeed very fortunate to have you here amongst us. So now, uh, with this, we have come to the end of Krishna Kanta Handikoy Memorial Lecture. Uh, now, I request Dr. Dibbujuti Mohanto, sir, based are in charge, Krishna Kanto Hondiko State of University, to offer the vote of thanks. So, please. Thank you, Sanika. So, I think uh, you can hear me. So, Hello? yes, you are audible. Yes, sir, we can hear okay. you. Okay, okay, okay. So, good afternoon to you all present here in this digital platform. Honorable chairperson of this function, Professor Ranjit Kumar Debugu. Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you now. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Respected speaker, Professor Sergei Dimitrievich Cherebriani, our honorable vice chancellor and distinguished guests. Finally, it will be time for expressing our sincere appreciation to all of you for being with us in the memorial lecture program. State Open University, I feel it as a great honor and responsibility to be here to offer the official vote of thanks. First of all, I offer our genuine heartfelt gratitude to Professor Anjit Kumar Devagoswami sir for sparing his valuable time to be here to share this August function. We are indeed very happy and your cooperation would always be there with us for the academic activities of the university. Thank you, sir. It is a rare opportunity and a pleasure to hear from an illustrious scholar like Professor Sergei Dimitrievich Serebriani, who has delivered an illuminating lecture on the life and work of the great Indologist Krishnakant Handik and glimpses of his Russian contact in context of the present topic with his long association with India. He has the first time experience of our society as he learned in some of the languages of India, and as such, it has reverberated in our hearts what he has expressed today in matters of correspondence of Gandhi and Tolstoy, and also on Indo-Russian cultural responsibility relationship. Thank you, Professor Sergei, sir, 
our words may not be capable of communicating our sense of gratitude for your remarkable thoughts and sharing your valuable time with us. Thank you once again, sir. We are grateful to respected Sri Ahalla Gogoi Baidu, the daughter of the genius in whose name we have organized this lecture program for offering a short piece as tribute to the great scholar. I would like to keep on record our in all personal platform, especially we offer our gratitude to our honorable founder, Vice Chancellor, Professor Srina Boruwasar, and some of our former senior officers, and also our former Vice Chancellor, Dr. Hitesh Deka. We have amongst us the honorable members of board and respected members of different committees of the university and many of the teaching faculties of different educational institutions of India and abroad, members from media houses and all other dignitaries from within India and abroad who richly deserve our gratitude and I offer the same to all of them. Because of technical problem, as it is a virtual platform, I could not name all of you, so please excuse me for this. It is really very difficult to express in words our gratefulness to all the guests and dignitaries present here in this virtual platform for sparing their valuable time. Though it is our official program, but I take the privilege to offer our gratitude to our honorable vice chancellor, Professor Kandar Podassar, support and inspiring the community members and the university community all the time during the arrangement of the memorial lecture for making it a success. And finally, it is our deep appreciation to all the members of the organizing committee of the memorial lecture program, the anchor, and all officials of the university all the members of the teaching and non-teaching staff of the university and all those who directly or indirectly were involved all the time, even during the lockdown situation in organizing the event and for their wholehearted support, it become possible to arrive successfully at the end of this program. So once again, a grand applause to all of you Thank you, all of you. Stay, stay safe and secure. Thank you. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Thank you. Uh, now we will conclude today's event with the Ahom Hongit. So for this, I request Mr. Binod Deka to play the Ahom Hongit. grateful to you all for making this virtual event a success and thank you so much stay healthy and stay safe see you again thank you <laughs>